week. Um, we will uh, try and make time for our questions and comments at the end. Our, um, our chairperson for the activity committee at Villa Gardens, Gene Owen, will help us uh, navigate that section after the speaker. Uh, we are recording this call. So that's your reminder, Catherine. We're recording this call. <laughs> Um, we've invited many non-Villa Gardens residents, so I'm really thrilled you're all here today. But I want to give you a little brief background before we begin. In the fall of 2018, Villa Gardens resident Nan Johnson, who's on this call, wanted to make sure that everyone celebrated, and I mean everyone, celebrates the centennial of the passing of the 19th Amendment in the year 2020. So she gathered a small group of women in Pasadena and the idea of celebrating on January 1st with a float in the Rose Parade was born. Maybe you saw that float. It was titled Years of Hope, Years of Courage. Had beautiful Lady Liberty riding high with 18 um, distinguished prominent figures on the float and 100 men and women dressed in white walking behind the float reminiscent of a suffrage parade. It was a great kickoff and celebration for celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Many celebrations are continuing and some have been stalled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But with Nan and a different small group of people, we gathered to discuss continued celebrations and we're calling ourselves 2020 plus and starting with this speaker series during the month that the 19th Amendment was, pat was signed, which the date of that is August 26th, for those who don't know. Nan Johnson, the inspiration for all of this celebration, spent much of her life in Rochester, New York, the home of the suffrage movement. She served as a, in the legislature of Monroe County for 20 years, taught at the University of Rochester, and was the founding director of the Susan B. Anthony Center at the University of Rochester. She also had very close civic ties to Seneca Falls, which is the home of the National Women's Hall of Fame and the Women's Rights National Park. There's too many accolades to mention here. So without further ado, Nan, you might need to unmute your uh, microphone at the top there, but take it away. There we go. I guess I'm unmuted now. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to say a few things about um, this whole um, project that we're doing. 2020 plus is a forum for the future. And that you may not have heard before. I've said 2020 plus, but in the last week or so, I have added that. 2020 plus a forum for the future. And there'll be a lot more to talk about that in the future. It continues the theme expressed in Pasadena 2020's float in the Tournament of Roses Parade on January 1st. Hope, as expressed by the tournament president, Laura Farber. And this is what Laura said. With hope, anything, in fact, everything, and remember that, is possible. Hope is that which simply is the possibility of fulfillment. There is dignity and and respect, joy, and remember that, and happiness, aspiration, and that's particularly important, and achievement. Hope never quits. Through hope, we can aspire to our best and in turn inspire those others around us to reach higher. The Pasadena 2020 float theme, Years of Courage, Years of Hope, celebrated the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment women won, won the vote, were not given. Our host today is Jean Owen. Jean is a Villa Garden resident and chair of the Villa Gardens Activities Committee. Since moving to Villa Gardens, Jean has been a leader in the Villa Gardens and Pasadena civic life. So here, oh. you know, please take it away. Thank you, thank you, Nan. Um, this is, is an exciting, thing to be a part of and we're all learning. This is a first for so many of us. And I applaud each of you for getting on to begin with 
and uh, learning how to use this new technology. Ellen Snortland, who those of you who joined us last time, we, we saw Lynn to it and she showed part of her uh, PBS documentary on the actual suffrages. Uh, today we have Ellen Snortland who is going to give us a different view. Uh, Ellen is very active in the community. Many of you I'm sure know her or have seen her. I first met Ellen at the YWCA when she was talking about her book, Beauty Bites Beast. And it was a whole take on women's learning how to defend themselves. So I read the book and I gave it to my daughter and then we took a class. And uh, thanks to Ellen, I, I probably have forgotten some of it, but I know how to walk, uh, walk with confidence. So Ellen, would you share your experience? Ellen was one of the walkers uh, in the parade on, on uh, New Year's Day, uh, but there's so much more for her to share with us. So Ellen, take it away. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm a columnist with the Pasadena Weekly and I'm also uh, what I call a women's history nerd. And one of the things I love about women's history is that I'll never ever stop learning because there's so much I've never even heard of. And it's constantly this archeology span of these fabulous accomplishments and brave, courageous women. And the, the story of suffrage, of course, is one of the most important parts because most of us have heard of Gandhi and have heard of Martin Luther King and they stand on the mighty shoulders of women who were practicing civil disobedience and nonviolent uh, directed action before Gandhi was. So they actually stand on the shoulders of mighty, mighty, mighty women, most of whom none of us have heard of. Um, so I'm also on the board of the National Women's History Alliance. And um, there we, we invite you to become a member if you go to nwhp.org there you can sign up you can shop i would like to start a custom of giving each other women's equality day gifts or cards at the very least um, because it is a very important day and i'll get into that a little later um, i imagine this group is more schooled and more educated in the seneca falls convention than most groups. Um, but they also say that you have to hear a name or hear about an event at least six to seven times. I don't know why that number, but before it sticks and you own it. So if you've heard some of these things before, just count it towards your six or seven. And with Nan, of course, she's been teaching this stuff. So uh, it's nothing new for her. Um, I think it's important to provide context for the Seneca Falls Convention, which is really where the public idea of win women winning the vote uh, was first promulgated. And it was radical. It was radical. And um, I'm going to have Ken start us off here with our title and presentation. Okay, so the context for the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention is the brainchild of two women that are very important to us. One is Lucretia Mott, who was a Quaker. Not only was she a Quaker, she was a Quaker minister. And that's important because the Quakers were one of the only, if not the only, at least Western denomination that allowed women to speak in church or to be educated as thoroughly as boys were. And one of the quotes from Lucretia I love is, the world has never yet seen a truly great and virtuous nation because in the degradation of woman, the very fountains of life are poisoned at their source. That's some pretty strong language. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton, figured into Lucretia Mott's life and they created a partnership that we still feel the echoes of. 
they met on a ship bound for London for the World Anti-Slavery Convention. And this is where their lifelong friendship begins. Mrs. Stanton was spending her honeymoon on the ship and her husband was a delegate to the Anti-Slavery Convention. And Mrs. Mott was an abolitionist delegate from Philadelphia. She was there with her husband, Mr. Mott, aptly enough, who was also a delegate. Now just remember how difficult transatlantic travel was. It was just in 1840, which is when the anti-slavery anti convention was, that transatlantic travel became viable for more upper class people. Um, and as a matter of fact, with the combination of steam engines combined with sails, the trip could take as little as 12 days. Now, just to give you more context, in England, Queen Victoria was Queen of England, who, and she was anti-suffrage, by the way, and Martin Van Buren was the President of the United States. Does anyone know anything about Martin Van Buren? I, the only thing I know about him is that he was our only bilingual president, and he spoke both Dutch and English fluently. Um, but imagine, imagine traveling for 12 days and being told once you got to the anti-slavery convention that they were not going to allow the women to participate. The indignity. And here was this huge convention, and it was the first anti-slavery convention that was international, and the women were required to sit in a segregated section of the hall. And they were not gonna allow them to even be in the hall, but they finally relented and said they could sit in a segregated section. Well, obviously the gender segregation did not sit well with Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton or the other women who had traveled at great cost and great use of resources to this convention. And as a matter of fact, a lot of men were appalled at the idea of segregating the women. And so they sat with the women, which, yay, solidarity with allies. We always need allies in any kind of social progress. So after leaving the convention on the first day, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton went home, walked home or to their hotel arm in arm and vowed we resolve to hold our own convention as soon as we return home and form a society to ad advocate for the rights of women. They pondered that even if your chains are made of gold, they're chains nonetheless. And after working all this time to free slaves and to free the people who were enslaved, they looked at each other and went, wow, we have golden chains. <laughs> Thus, thus, the inequities toward women were revealed simply from being in a movement about the freedom of other people. And similarly, in the 1960s, when told they could only serve coffee or take dictation or that the only place for women in the Vietnam movement where it was horizontal, oh. <laughs> uh, the women used that indignation to really launch the second wave of women's liberation. So allies and one movement giving birth to another is throughout our history of social progress. Also key to the Seneca Falls Convention was the influence of the Haudenosaunee, which was a confederation of indigenous people in the Northeast that the French called the Iroquois. Now, we wonder sometimes where the ideas of voting and liberation and being able to maintain property, where did Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton come up with such radical ideas? Well, I would say it was from the Haudenosaunee women that they were in contact with and communicated with. As a matter of fact, Lucretia and James Mott went to the Haudenosaunee as missionaries and came back with ideas that the Haudenosaunee women had given them. 
For instance, they, the women of the Haudenosaunee, they owned the land, the lodge, the children, and they said ours is the right of adoption, of life or death. Ours is the right to raise up and depose chiefs. <clears throat> we still don't have that right. Ours is the right of representation at all councils, all councils, not just keeping, taking care of the longhouses, which is what their shelters were called. Um, ours is the right of representation at all councils. Ours is the right to make and abrogate treaties. That's with other entities, other units, other nations. Ours is the right of supervision over domestic and foreign policies. Ours, the trusteeship of the tribal property. Ours, our lives are valued again as high as man's. So the Iroquois women, when the Quaker missionaries came, said, we whom you pity as drudges reached centuries ago the goal that you're now nearing. <laughs> so the seeds of the Seneca Falls Convention took root during a tea party that very few people hear about. This is, st this is eight years after the 1840 Anti-Slavery Convention, by the way. So that fateful event took place on July 9th, 1848, when Jane Hunt invited Elizabeth Cady Stanton to her house for tea. Hunt was a Quaker and she invited three other Quakers, Lucretia Mott and her sister, Martha Wright and Mary Ann McClintock to the gathering as well. All five women started the afternoon as individuals, but by the end of the day, they were at the helm of a collective movement that would change women's lives forever. The Boston Tea Party was important to history and so was the other Tea Party, the Seneca Falls Tea Party. By the way, it was women's dissatisfaction with tea prices that prompted the more famous Boston Tea Party. During Jane Hunt's Tea Party, a young mother and frustrated homemaker, as I mentioned, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, poured out her frustrations. And within 10 days, the Tea Party turned into a movement they advertised the upcoming convention in the local paper on July 18, 1848. The ad helped to draw hundreds of interested women and men to the first recorded women's rights convention in the United States. Imagine the excitement. In July of 1848, a teenager named Charlotte Woodard read an announcement in the local paper about a group of women who would be meeting at a Methodist church in Seneca Falls, which was simply a modest wagon ride from her family's farm near Syracuse. A convention dis to discuss the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of women, it read. Woodward was intrigued and she attended. She became the first youngest woman, excuse me, she became the youngest woman to sign the Declaration of Sentiments, which I'll get to later. It was July and likely very warm and humid. Imagine wearing all those layers of clothing.
I often joke that had women had easier things to wear, we would have gotten further faster. <laughs> Just imagine the excitement, the scandal. Women were not supposed to speak in public? That was outrageous, astonishing, amazing, and very interesting to a lot of people. Roads were bumpy and dusty. It really took significant effort to get to Seneca Falls and discomfort. Seneca Falls itself was a prosperous town, prosperous town due to the Cayuga and Seneca rivers and proximity to the Erie Canal. It also had stations on the Underground Railway for the people who were running from slavery. Conditions for white middle-class women were so confining that the corset is a perfect metaphor for what it was like to be a woman at the time. That said, conditions for enslaved women were so meager and cruel, it's no wonder so many of the abolitionist women were committed to outlawing slavery. When people arrived in Seneca Falls and went to the Wesleyan Chapel, where the meeting would be held, it was locked. So they had to boost a young man through one of the windows so he could unlock it for them. Apparently, the Methodist minister who said they could use the hall or the chapel changed his mind and didn't have the guts to tell them, so he just left it locked. Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote, the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpation on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Wow. Not only was the document that Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote radical, but again, speaking in public was scandalous. Except for Quakers, as I've mentioned, women were not supposed to speak in public for any reason. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton, one of our public intellectual foremothers, wrote the Declaration of Sentiments. It intentionally has copied the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. Well, women did not give their consent to any of the things that they had to follow, including they were taxed, they would be jailed, they could have all sorts of downsides of government, but none of the upsides. So along with the declaration, several resolutions were adopted that addressed the patriarchal culture at that time, which was men were preventing women from owning land or earning wages. They were compelling women to submit to laws created without their representation. They were giving men authority to divorce and child custody proceedings and decisions. They were preventing women from gaining a college education. They were preventing women from participating in most public church affairs. They were aiming to make women dependent and, and submissive to men. And they were preventing women from voting, something which was so outrageous to even think about. The first public call for women's right to vote met with more controversy than any other resolution. In fact, Lucretia Mott thought it was too, too much, too soon. And at the convention, however, a major ally of ours, Frederick Douglass, argued for the vote by saying, in this denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of woman and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens, but the meaning and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power of the government. Frederick Douglass got what it cost us as a nation to not include the intellect of women. The Declaration of Sentiments ended with these words. Now, 
in the view of this entire disenfranchisement of one half the people of this country, their social and religious degradation, and view of the unjust laws above mentioned, and because women do feel themselves aggrieved, oppressed, and fraudulently deprived of their most sacred rights, we insist that they have immediate ad admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of these United States. Continuing, in entering upon the great work before us, we anticipate no small amount of misconception, misrepresentation, and ridicule. But we shall use every instrumentality within our power to affect our ob object. We shall employ agents, circulate tracts, petition the state and national legislatures, and endeavor to enlist the pulpit and the press in our behalf. We hope this convention will be followed by a series of conventions embracing every part of the country. These women and men were incredibly brave to put their signature to such outrageous ideas. So you can see on this slide that the number of women that signed and also the gentlemen who signed. After public outcry, some of the signers asked to have their signatures removed mostly because of ridicule. The first national women's vote amendment bill was entered in Congress in 1878 at the federal level. It took 30 years for the women's rights vote amendment to be introduced, introduced to the US Congress. Now, in other parts of the country, nine years after Wyoming won the vote, in 1970, 1872, and eight years after Utah women won. Imagine, they declared it in 1848, and so little happened so slowly. A hallmark of courage is to work on something great that you know you'll never be able to do for yourself. By 1919, when both houses of Congress approved the 19th Amendment to be sent to the states, both Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were dead. Then moving forward quite quickly, Tennessee was the 36th state to ratify. And that was ratified by one vote on August 18th. It was officially registered as a, a, a constitutional amendment on August 26, 1920, 100 years ago. So it was officially ratified on August 18th, but not registered and added to the Constitution until August 26, which is why we celebrate August 26th. Now, most people don't know that Susan B. Anthony did not attend the Seneca Falls Convention. It wasn't until a few years after that that she partnered with Elizabeth Cady Stanton to become lifelong, a lifelong dynamite power combination for women's rights. Even though the formal amendment for women's votes to be included was named after Miss Anthony. Most people have heard of the Communist Manifesto written by Karl Marx. It too was published in 1848. And I would argue that the Seneca Falls Women's Manifesto was just as, if not more important than Karl Marx's. Yet, most people have never really heard about the Declaration of Sentiments. Let's see, what else happened in 1848? Stephen Foster published O oh, Susanna, and that is uh, a target of Black, Live, that Black Lives Matter protesters since he um, wrote music that was very pro-plantation and pro-slavery. Uh, James Polk was the US president and it's no wonder that the fad or the trend toward spiritualism started because women died on child, in childbirth on a regular basis. And almost every family had one or more children that had not survived their childhood. The world was ripe for the rise of women who had to move from being considered property 
to being considered people, full people. And as a postscript, remember the teenager, Charlotte Woodard? She never got to vote. She was alive, but was too ill when we won the vote. But she was never able to cast a ballot, but she did live long enough to see that we won. We won! Anyway, that is the end of my presentation. And um, if Jean would like to open this up for uh, Q and A, here's the uh, National Women's History Alliance information. And well, I invite you to go there and see if there are any children's books that you'd like to get for younger people and for yourself. By the way, whenever you feel behind in a certain topic, one of my editors said to me, if you wanna brush up on any area that you don't feel like you are articulate with in a kid's book. It'll start you off. So thank you for having me. That's right. How true that is. Um, now, are there any, any questions? We do have time uh, for questions for Ellen. And I don't see that anybody has written any. I think under chat you can write, but has so raise your hand and I'll try and see you. I can only get nine on my screen at once. Or you can unmute yourself if you want. You can unmute. Carolyn, question? I had quite a problem because my internet connection is so unstable for a lot of time when I I knew what should be said but I wasn't getting it so I haven't formulated a question right now yet oh, okay um, I, I think I thought that. you did they let me just take a minute and yeah. welcome Miriam uh, yes. it, it, she's I'm been Miriam. gone from Villa Gardens and I see her joining us welcome Miriam it's wonderful to see you Good. Um, are, I, I can't see any hands. Just speak up if you've got a question. Um, I'm curious, this is Donnie, and I'm curious how you, what was your path, Ellen, in getting hooked into becoming a woman's history nerd, as you say? I think uh, it was fueled by indignation and like, I was, we did all this stuff and nobody told me? Why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> it was like, whoa, that's not right. <laughs> so um, I was just fueled by outrage, really. Um, when I started to dig even a little deeper, I'm going, oh man, even the, who, who decided that women's domestic lives weren't interesting? I certainly thought they were. Um, and, you know, I think too that it had, we've been smart enough in school to have the history of children included in history for kids. It, I would have been much more interested faster had I known that kids even had a history and that women had histories. Um, so the, the simple answer to that is outrage. Um, I just wanted to share something. Am I yes. Sally? Yeah. Um, that way. Back in, about, I think it was about 1972, my husband, because he was a corporate executive, was invited to attend the Aspen Institute for Humanistic Studies. And we went there for, I guess it was a week. And they had all kinds of seminars and so on. And the women were relegated to stands, so to speak. We were not allowed to join any of the discussions. So I... We weren't the executives, but still in all, I think it would have been nice to have been included. What year was that? I think it was around 1971 or two. Hmm. Wow. Did they have other activities for the women to do while the men were doing important things? Well, uh, more or less. <laughs> Field trips. <laughs> Shopping excursions. Yeah, interesting, interesting. I don't know if it's changed. I don't know how they do it now. Oh, it's a, uh, it's set, uh, it's integrated. 
I, at least for white people, I don't know what the um, race breakdown is, but uh, there are quite a few women that I think are even presenting. Well, I, there certainly are a lot more well, women, there are executives, women executives, now. executives now. There weren't many then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. I was raised to be a, an executive's wife. And so I straddle the line between having one foot firmly planted in learning how to be an executive wife and the other foot in being a, a modern woman out there in the world. So I straddle both lines. <laughs> I was an executive wife and um, I, I wrote a poem about it. I was uh, a corporate wife and all I got was strife and then something about, um, so I, sought a better life, which I did when I was divorced when I was 45 and I moved to New Mexico and found what life was really about. Good for oh, you. Interesting. I just want to plug, I don't want to give a plug to a, a Swedish television series called Miss Freeman's War, which is all about Swedish suffrage ranging from like 1905 to 1910. It's um, three episodes per season, four seasons, that's it. But it's so informative of, it's very much what American women went through too, but it's, I can't, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's really great. Can you repeat um, the I, I find it very interesting that Frederick Douglass was one of, according to what you said, if I'm right, was one of the first supporters okay, for the me, for the women. Let me speak. Funny. Let me speak on that, please. First of all, 1848 was a year around the world on, and that should be familiar to you now, when all kinds of ferment was happening. Ferment in Germany, the German socialism was at its peak. It's very similar in many ways to what is happening today. And they were related. For one thing, we began around that time to get immigration from Germany, from uh, Sweden, and uh, other countries that had a different attitude toward women and toward work. So that's one thing to remember. Susan B. Anthony was originally an abolitionist. She lived in Rochester, New York, and that's where she worked. She was introduced to Elizabeth Cady Stanton by Amelia Bloomer, who invented the bloomers, and who wrote a, a magazine called The Lily. She introduced the two of them. Uh, uh, Susan B. Anthony was very important in Rochester. She lived there. Her house is still there. She got women admitted to the University of Rochester by pledging her own insurance. Um, she came to, there's a statue on the, that show the, the water of the uh, in uh, Seneca Falls. There's a statue there, a bronze statue showing uh, Amelia Bloomer um, introducing Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, Susan B. Anthony together. And then, of course, they worked for uh, the um, suffrage for the years to begin with. The brains behind it, the radical brains, was um, Stanton. She, uh, they called her Aunt Susan. Um, <clears throat> Um, Stanton had five children. Those two boys you show in the picture with them are called the savages because one of the things they did was set their baby afloat in the water and uh, somebody had to go and rescue the baby before they got it. They were really wild kids. And uh, Stanton wrote uh, all this time and um, then um, um, uh, Susan B. Anthony would do the reading of it. Um, <laughs> Um, Stanton was really a radical, radical thinker. She rewrote the Bible. Uh, uh, um, there's still copies of that available. Susan B. Anthony said, please don't, Susan, because everything's against us now, and that'll be one more thing. She said, too bad, and she wrote it. Um, she was a tremendous radical presence. I wanted to tell you about this book particularly because last <clears throat> week, Bob Carlson asked about women on boards and that kind of thing and why there were so few women. I want to show you one woman who has really broken through and she is also African American. She was the first woman um, of many on boards of, of a very few women and the first African American woman. She was on the board of Gannett. She was on the board of all kinds of, of the major, major 
corporations. She was something else. Her name is Dolores Wharton. And this is a book that's out. I told you. Hold it up. Can you higher. hold it up higher? Higher, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a wonderful picture. She's a very handsome woman. She's the wife of the chancellor of SUNY, Clifton Wharton. I happened to be a SUNY trustee at the time that we were looking for a new chancellor and was the only woman on the uh, search committee and picked um, Cliff Wharton. So I've gotten to know them quite well. And this is Dolores's book. And it's, uh, there's a chapter of how she <laughs> worked with the corporations and on the boards. And I sent that, uh, she sent it to me online and I sent it to Bob Carlson and he's going to include works of, and comments about it in the next advocates session. So you all be looking for that. So um, Dolores Wharton is, and her book is something that you might want to see. Can you and show the book again, please? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see uh, it? Oh, the title Thank is you. what? The title is Wart. What's her first name? Wart. Her name is Dolores and is spelled D O L O R E S. And her last name is Wharton, W H A R T O N. And they live in whatever that thing is near the. And the, the title United. of the book? The title of the book is um, A Multicultural Life. A Multicultural Life. She's very good looking, by the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I have one other book, which my wonderful son-in-law got me that you all would recognize. There's Inez Milholland. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it's a book called Seeing Suffrage, the Suff Washington Suffrage Parade of 1913, which was an iconic parade of women fighting for, the, um, for suffrage and its effect on the American political landscape. I'll give these both to the library here when um, I pass them along, but I wanted to tell you about um, both of those. Was there something else I should tell you about Seneca Falls? Uh, Seneca Falls is of course now the home of the only park in our park system dedicated to women, the National Women's Rights Historical Park in Seneca Falls. Um, uh, the, uh, it is also the home of the National Women's Hall of Fame. There are a number of inductees uh, who live in California uh, who are, have been inducted to the Hall of Fame. I am the only living emerita on the board. That's why they come to me for various things. Um, what else can I tell you? We have been in touch from the beginning. I can't praise enough. Molly McGregor and the Women's History Alliance out of California. They gave us originally our 501c3, so we didn't have to apply for our status to, to begin to raise money for that float. So I wanna tell you about that. And I wanna emphasize that we are now calling it uh, 2020 plus a forum for the future. And this is important, and I will tell you more about it in the days to come. But um, it is something I am very interested in working on for us all for the future. And I don't mean just this year, I mean the year after, and the year after, and the year after, because this is a work in progress, as is democracy. Democracy is not something that was achieved as a nation state one day or the other, it's a process. And it's what we are working toward. And that's my ranting for today, okay? Thanks, thanks, Nan. Did, did someone else have a book to share with us? Yes, I do. Oh, good. I don't see who you are, but- I'm oh, Lucinda. Good. Lucinda, thank yes. you. Uh, I have been to Seneca Falls. I went to um, the museum there, uh, Women's National Hall of Fame. Um, they uh, select a woman for each year uh, to uh, be in the Hall of Fame. And, you know, I just thought this was just a, such a great book. It's got a, a page on all of these famous women, women, all the way, this is all the way up to, uh, uh, oh, hmm, I don't know when they were. Well, last, last year, and uh, it's not just one woman that's chosen each year. It's a number of uh, women who are chosen. I was a judge for the inductees this year. And when um, I'm able to announce them, I will tell you all. But it is a big deal. They do it in October. Um, they won't be able to do it 
as they usually have a big, you know, that goes on for days and they have marches and hoo-hahs and what have you. They won't be able to do that this time, but it is a very big deal. It brings a lot of celebrities there. And uh, it's, it's a very um, interesting uh, participation and an acknowledgement of women's accomplishment. And it includes a lot of diversity, which is a good thing. It spends a lot of time, you know, Ida Wells and Harriet Tubman, people like that, but I'm, I'm more. Good. But, um, thank you. Uh, Lucinda, thank you for bringing that to our attention. It's nice to know that, that you've been there uh, for those of us that yeah. are just learning about it. Uh, Ellen, thank you so much. Uh, you continue to be just a treasure to, uh, to listen to. I thank do. You. I do. I, I wanted to return to the first question that was asked, which was about Frederick Douglass and how he came to connect with the group. And I don't know if that got answered or not. No, I don't think it did. Um, the, the parallels between enslavement and women's status was obvious to anybody who had a, a good brain and wasn't committed to the status quo. And um, I don't know who exactly introduced whom, but he was an autodidact uh, he was a freed slave, and he just completely saw the parallels. Plus, he was very interested in having black women have the vote also. Of course. So, what, you know, it, it would make sense for him to align himself with, because it wasn't the, even though it kind of gets played out the way that it was for the white women to vote, uh, that created a whole huge controversy, because with the, 14th, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, women of all colors really got thrown under the wagon. Uh, and that didn't turn out very well for black men either because with reconstruction, um, they were basically subjected to such violence to keep them from voting. When, having won the vote constitutionally was not what they had dreamed it might be. So, uh, but that's a very painful part of our history. Uh, white women being pitted against black men and the prejudices of the day. I mean, it was insulting to um, a lot of people. Sojourner Truth was insulted that um, Frederick Douglass decided to go for the uh, black men's vote only. Um, Thank and, you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Donine, would you have fill Frederick us great, another great, question? Great grandson here on the 31st. Um, Donnie, Amanda. would you fill us in on next week, please? Okay. Next week, we have Deborah Hughes, who is the president and CEO of the National Susan B. Anthony Museum and House in Rochester. On the 20th, that's the 17th. On the 24th, we'll have Martha Zavala. She's the current president of the League of Women Voters, Pasadena, San Gabriel area. And then on August 31st, what Nan just mentioned, Ken Morris, who is the, I think it's three greats, great, great, great grandson right. of Frederick Douglass and also a descendant of Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington and right. he runs the, um, he's the president of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative. So he'll join us the last week of the month. Can do I we have a, do we, if we had one more minute, I have another, one more question, but I don't want to over. I just want to make sure that we have the same Zoom. Do we have the same Zoom link? Yes, same time. Same Zoom link will okay. work for all of them. Thank, Thank you for asking. That's a good question. Um, Ellen was, um, Deborah Hughes, who's coming next week, and Ellen this week were walked behind the float. And I didn't know if you had just a short, what was your experience? Um, walking behind the float or if you wanted to talk about your further the celebrations that you're doing this year Ellen I don't know which is the most appropriate question or answer but if you want right, to tell well, us it, a little bit about um, that. it was a dream come true I have been a feminist uh, since I was like 14 and I was subject to a lot of derision and ridicule and uh, mm -hmm. resistance for taking that stance and it was the first time I felt like we and the position I had taken as a teenager was validated. Um, and I, I, I almost cried during the entire parade. Um, and it was. That's wonderful, Alan. Thank you. Somebody has a question? Did somebody say? 
Thank you, Ellen. Yeah, it's good for us. I, I, what I found working on the float, you know, I have one experience because I worked at the pre-float. <laughs> And being um, amongst those women as they were setting up was very moving. And I just kept thinking, there are a hundred stories here of the hundred people who walked. Plus there were 18 people. Plus those that rode. Uh, there were there exactly were 18 that rode on the float. Yeah. And five of them are just, yeah. And everybody just had their own personal experience and their own personal story. It was, um, it was rather moving in that way. So thank you for sharing your experience. My dentist said, my wife was sitting next to me and she had tears streaming down her face. Oh. I think the emotional impact of that um, presentation was beyond what we ever even thought would happen. It was I think so too. So moving to a lot of people. Absolutely I mean, so. My, my son-in-law was the only guy actually marching. He's a lifelong resident here and an eminent retired lawyer. And he said this, this and his uh, clerkship with uh, Justice Brennan was one of the highlights of his life, and he walked in. He walked in with all of you women uh, for the around the float. Right. How many slopes did you wear, Ellen? <laughs> huh? <laughs> I've been asked that. <laughs> I wore three because I knew it was going to be cold that morning, and. Yeah. Okay, so you you did the right thing. Yes, I did. You wore as many slips as they had to. Yeah, that's okay. Right. All right. Well, if there are no I, I, further one last question, comments Ellen. or questions, just just Ellen. a very factual question, Ellen. I saw your display at the Pasadena uh, Central Library uh, in the fall, and you did it again in January, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but now the library is closed. So yep. do you have any plans for doing it again if the library opens? Yeah, I'd be happy to do it again because I'd rather have my stuff laid than packed away, you know. That and would be I, wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank that you. would be wonderful, Ellen. Yeah. Did anybody see the presentation yesterday um, that Bonnie Wallace did with um, um, Marilyn Artis, who's the one who has created uh, her flag. Which... I wasn't able to get on there. I I was too late. Yeah, and it was, was just fascinating. She decided that she would create a flag celebrating the 36 states that ratified the 19th Amendment. And she traveled to each state, starting with the first one in order, starting with Wyoming. and. Um, she gave little stories about, you know, the process of doing that. It was just very inspiring. That's and I thought it was interesting because Bonnie did a history at the beginning and then Marilyn did the, the flag. And I wrote back to Bonnie. I said, you know, it's wonderful. I'm not an artist, although I do like to sing, but that when we can harness the the creativity of artists who also feel that they are activists. It just brings history, it, it just, uh, it, it's like the, the final garnishing of history to have that happen. Bonnie was very helpful when we started this whole project of the, getting the float. <laughs> If anybody wants to check that out, it's her flag, H E R F L A G dot com. Thank Marilyn you. actually lives in Oklahoma. She came out, she walked behind the float. She was one of those, uh, and so did Bonnie, the one who did the presentation. Thank you so much, Ellen. What a wonderful um, presentation. So hopefully, we'll see you all next week at three o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.